What is up down and sideways, you beautiful individuals? We have returned. It's League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you for an absolutely rapid fire jam packed weekend recap finale of regular season action in the LCS is where we start. And it was, we knew it might be a bit of a race down for that first seed at the end of the regular season. They don't do it giving me the utmost confidence, but because they have a 2-0 head-to-head against the 100 Thieves, it is FlyQuest securing that top spot. But this weekend was full of everyone on this team getting caught out randomly and not looking clean. I think when you're looking at the story of the LCS this final weekend for the Spring Split 2024, the story has got to be about disappointments all across the board, except for probably not 100 Thieves team, and they're not even immune to a little bit of disappointment over this weekend. I think the things that a lot of us were looking for, for teams to shape up, provide that step up, that level up before we get to these playoffs, give yourself that, you know, that push above everybody else so you're standing head and shoulders atop of it. Nobody really did that in the LCS. And I, I, I mean, FlyQuest, I think I think Jensen has been the most solid and consistent guy from start to finish now in the regular season. But you're down 3 plus K against Dignitas. You need a 43 minute back and forth barn burner that you probably should have lost to NRG if you're FlyQuest. But it's, it's still enough for them to live forward and take that top spot. Um, but you still are waiting for that bot lane to reach a level that the rest of the team is playing at as well. Yeah, and I think that was something that a lot of us had hoped when you saw the bot lane, you knew the potential that these young players had, that they would be able to get on to speed with the rest of the team, Whippo inspired, these veterans. And they came out I, of the gates at that level. They've kind of teetered since then. Yes, that's been the thing. As the course of the season, the course of the split has gone on, we have seen continued success, some improvements from players like Whippo inspired. We've seen Jensen be incredibly stable in that mid lane and one of the better options in the LCS, there's something to be said about Jensen. You know, number one, before we get negative, give props to Jensen for that type of performance and that type of bounce back. Number two, not the best sign for NA mids in general for when we're thinking about international competition pretty soon. But with FlyQuest and heading for these playoffs, it is that bottom lane that we're waiting to see really get that firepower going, get that lethality up where you can start to respect them as that top seed threat. And... It was supposed to be Cloud9 being that absolute terror threat coming in. Far and away the easiest schedule on the docket. We were demanding a dominant 3-0 against some bottom tier teams. Losing to Immortals, a 51 minute win against Shopify that you are not winning if not for one, two, three heroic engages out of Jojo Pian on Nico. I, I, I think the only other time that we have seen, uh, there might be one other weekend throughout this split that we have seen a worse performance from Cloud9, of course, more so an 0-3 level of performance. But when you're asking for a 3-0, and not just 3-0s, we're asking for clean ones this weekend, this schedule that had lined up and where you're lo leaning towards in these playoff uh, picture, you had to step on the gas if you were a Cloud9 and you had shown signs starting to figure it out starting to put it together in all aspects across this this summoner's rift didn't come through at all this final weekend for this cloud 19. yeah we were looking at i think fudge actually had his best week of the split last week and then this week ah that was not it everyone's all of a sudden calling for licorice to replace him heading in the summer split obviously that's an overreaction but even berserker you know, even game one of the weekend, you think, okay, he's getting that confidence. He looked like he had the confidence in the other two games, but he was just getting caught out. He was getting too cocky. I, I want to find who has been the one slipping this message to pros that Lucian is this insanely powerful ADC because I'm not buying it. I, the numbers might be there. There might be a build path, whatever. I'm not seeing the results out on the rift from this champion. It's not working. I don't care. LCK, LPL, LCS. Throw them in there. Any of the regions, we have not seen this champion be that dominant threat yet. Just like earlier in the split when Cloud9 had that disastrous 0-3, they get shined in an underperformance 
by NRG, who won up that by going 0-4, and four, even losing the tiebreaker uh, for 5th-6 against Dignitas, which means they're going to be the final seed heading into the LCS. And I know it sounds like they were dealing with stuff behind the scenes. Dokla had to go to urgent care and not entirely sure what he's dealing with, but obviously that would have an impact on the team. But what happened to the other four players? Yeah, and it's and just one of those ones where, of course, then you're still dealing with those four players having to react to the situation that they're dealing with missing that one player. It still doesn't excuse this whole weekend's performance for NRG and how bad things have gotten for them. We had seen little glimpses kind of like Cloud9 that showed that maybe this was going to be the weekend that you started to see it really put together, use this as that stepping stone into playoffs to be at that level of performance. Not what we saw from this roster. I think all across the board, you're looking at players like Palafox, someone that can be a mega difference maker in the LCS. Opposite direction of difference making for this NRG team right now. Yeah, and individually, the level wasn't there. And as a team, they're giving up a 20 minute Baron uncontested for free to Dignitas. Like what's going on? Yeah, and then never mind that matchup. You throw them into the 100 Thieves matchup, the tiebreaker, you know, type of stuff that you get later. Worse performance, I think, when you're talking about what you saw from them and when everything is on the line. This was a disappointing one. And when we're going through disappointments, which was a big theme across the board in this last week for the LCS, this continued one and this big one this weekend for NRG really is the downer for me. So should expect uh, them to win another title to fully channel that counter logic gaming <laughs> run through as they level up for playoffs. But really not thinking highly of them heading into this next round of LCS action. The only squad to have the perfect final Super Week are 100 Thieves who are still trying to get respect from the rest of the league. But they're picking Shaco in the jungle uh, for River. It didn't do very much, but it didn't matter because... Rookie of the split, Mr. Sniper is getting solo kills left, right, and center. He has 12 solo kills on the split now. The next highest in the entire league only has five. Oh, and I love this story. And it has been so good given kind of just what the whole situation and expectations were for this 100 Thieves team, for them to beat them by almost every single measure is fantastic to see at this last weekend of the LCS as you laid out. General Sniper, one of the big parts and one of the big reasons for that, he was someone that a lot of people wanted to have expectations for, but everyone was very cautious because we knew, you know, uh, how young he was and where we're trying to shape and hope his career ends up. Pretty good signs early from what things have been with this 100 Thieves team. I think you're looking at that Shaco pick. You're talking about the live draft, you know, live, uh, you know, patch scenario that we are in in the LCS. One of those things, I think it's enabling, emboldening teams to take these risks, to say, we know our composition. We know the pick that is going to be that spicy one here. You don't. And you need to be able to react in the moment to counteract it. You got to know the counters. You got to think of some strategy, whatever. And if you don't, and you don't know how to play against what we're preparing, we have the advantage. And I think 100 Thieves fully showed that this weekend. Yeah, throw in the Vigar alongside the Shaco, that mid-jungle duo that everyone's always talking about, Shaco Vigar to take things over. The last dominoes that need to fall, I think, for them to fully garner respect from other players is you need the bot lane to be playing at a higher level. But truthfully, you could just hide on Smolder right now. So it's fine. And that's what they did against NRG. No and problems in that one. They've already laid out the blueprint for how to do that. 100 Thieves, very, very good week for them. Overall, a very good split against expectations. Playoffs, only the cherry on top. Two rookies and you're already, you know, one half game away from taking that first seed in the LCS. So a fantastic regular season across the board for 100T. It was not a fantastic day on the Rift for the T1 squad. The headliner, the titanic showdown of the weekend, and Gen G just kicked the door open. The door hit T1 in the face, and then all five members just jumped on the door to beat down T1. Didn't even get a kill in the first game. I don't know if this roster of T1 has ever been unable to get a kill in a game. This was about uh, as badly T1 has been beat down before, and especially this you know, edition of T1, world champion T1, getting beat down like this. 
by their domestic rivals in Gen G. Yes, this was one that we, I, you know, I came out here with full confidence, even after we had a telecom war disappoint us and not quite live up to the hype. I knew Gen G T1, they got my back. There's always going to be a brawl, a fiesta happening for this one. It wasn't. It was a very clean, controlled, dominant, and quick paced victory from Gen G over T1. So there's obviously lots you can look at and highlight uh, across this series. The draft was pretty fantastic uh, for Gen G in both of these games. Game two, slightly closer uh, than that first game, but. When you look at the strengths of T1, obviously Faker roaming and having impact across the map is one of their huge points, especially when he's such a vocal leader. You can't do that against Chobi because he's perma-pushing the lane. It doesn't matter what the matchup is. Pays and Lahans are probably the only duo in the LCK that can just straight up match Guma and Kyria in the 2v2. Not only were they matching them in this series, they're double killing them uh, time to time. That leaves Canyon wide open to just camp Zeus time and time again, which happened across both these games. All that combines for a 2-0. Yeah, and I think heading into this one, we had talked about the power level of Keen up in the top side and how he was ready for this matchup against Zeus. One of the only times that we have seen someone really rise to that level of, of potential power. It was there, and we fully saw it uh, pushed through by Gen G. As you mentioned, Canyon getting on board with it and helping out in that top side, having Faker locked into that mid lane. Not really advantages going on in the bottom lane. It was an easy ticket for Gen G to pick up those advantages, start pushing that power, start hitting T1 with that big old wallet as they moved into the mid to late game. That was the control from Gen G. I think one of the other things, as you mentioned, the pick ban was almost perfect from Gen G. They got exactly what they wanted and they neutralized any of the heat really coming out of the T1 kitchen for draft. I think there's an angle if you're T1 that there might have been a couple of things you're keeping in that briefcase for playoffs that you wanted to bust out, but you kept under wraps, just keeping it cool in this situation because otherwise it was a very lukewarm dish served out by the T1 draft. Yeah, it just, there's something about this matchup domestically uh, that Genji always has the edge. T1's having fun in the kitchen, maybe cooking everything up. Things are looking good. And then the door gets kicked open and Genji's just there with the fire extinguisher. The whole kitchen gets put out and blasted to them. And it doesn't matter internationally. I mean, we hardly see these two match up internationally, but... It seems like there's something extra personal for Chovy in this head-to-head -head because he was hunting Faker in a lot of these team fights. He's getting the solo kill on the Corky in a fight. He's charming the Talia mid-ulti to catch him out. He was laser-focused on killing the Demon King. There's been enough victories on the side of Gen G recently, and especially big ones that actually matter domestically for this Gen G team. You know, putting up trophies, putting up your name in the LCK banners in the arena that you start to get that mental effect that is one of those things you got to be looking at i know it's an easy one to go i don't care i don't believe it whatever but when you start to build it up on the other side you maybe t1 doesn't care but gen g you're feeling good about these matches because you know you've had these head-to-heads you've had this edge that's a big one for me for t1 this is that flip side, right? How do you look at this? If you're Gen G, are you just coasting? Are you happy? You feel like you're on cloud nine? We've already beaten the best of the best. We are the top of it coasting through playoffs. Or do you look at T1 and do you say, oh, you got kicked down. You got the door slammed in your face here by your biggest rival. How do you bounce back? That fire, that heat before playoffs, that could be the ticket to get T1 accelerating even further up the list. Yeah, I'm just waiting for this pot to boil over when a playoff best of five rolls around and T1 is angry from continually being beat down by Gen G, getting denied so many LCK titles from the squad. Even with three new players coming over, the pattern continues to start off 2024. Imagine going to the LPL, looking at your schedule for the week, and you go, BLG and then JDG. Okay, that's what FPX was drawing on the schedule. After they lose to BLG, they dust themselves off. They show up against the three-time defending LPL champs. And what did they do? They swiftly hand them their first 2-0 loss on the season. Yes, Milky Way. Fantastic on Jax. Picks up an MVP on Xin Zhao. But you got to watch this series. You are highlighting life. In the bottom lane, he was 
fantastic peel on the Alistair in game one and a support rumble in game two that he absolutely took the game over with. Someone needs to do the deep dive in stats. I don't think Doc Dom has ever gotten the advantage over someone like Ruler. I think it's his first LCK. win against him, which is insane. Crazy. Crazy to see F. PX, you laid it out. What a ridiculous schedule to see BLG followed up by JDG. And to go know. one and one. Oh my goodness. Craziness from this rising LPL squad that we have talked about. FPX. I'm not comfortable putting Dark Horse because they ain't there. They are a real contender in this race for the LPL, especially Milky Ways popping off the way he did all the way through this series, games one and two. And then you mentioned it, life down in the bottom lane. Of course, Doc Dom, big part of that, but life, what a difference maker. What a pain in your keister that this support was if you're the side of JDG and Ruler. He, he saw that name tag of Ruler and all of a sudden he went to vintage Gen G life and said, ah, oh, I remember this form. Man, it was, it was excellent from him. I think the other things you're looking for with FPX, you're, you're checking in, uh, you know, with care in the mid lane. I think, okay, okay, level. The him. Annie was way better than last time he was playing Annie in that RE matchup. Yes, yes. So we will take that one on the, on the progress report for FPX, but very good things, very controlled from them. I think this is one of those ones where it's just more so about, okay, you know, is this, you know, JDG, they suck now? No, I think this is a JDG that kind of slips down a little bit more so into that middle of that contending pack in the LPL. And this is an FPX that is continuing that rocket ascent up in the LPL and where they're finding themselves in their contender status for this title. Despite such a good record, I think even before this loss, JDG did not feel like the title favorites, uh, even though the defending champions. Flandre was a bit exposed again in this series as he stepped back in for Sheer, who had his LPL debut. So still some questions for JDG. The only question for FPX is how high can this team really fly in the summer split? I'll tell you who can fly pretty damn high in the LEC. It's G2 Esports. Who to thunk? The defending champs, they hit the rift to kick off the spring split in the LEC. They already look like they're in peak playoff form, especially Caps in both of these games to kick things off for them, looking fantastic. Han Sama gets the easiest pentakill of his life on Smolder. They follow that up by showing the counter pick to Smolder in the Kog'Maw. Oh, oh, oh man this is something else what g2 is doing and it's one of those ones where i don't know what the proper real you know professional reaction to it is because on one level you're seeing this performance you're seeing the excellency of this team you're seeing the cog you're seeing the smolder and that's all before we're talking about someone like caps even and what he was doing over the course of this weekend and how fantastic he was playing you're looking at what g2 is able to accomplish and you go why play the rest of the split here? Because who's gonna rise up to this type of level? Of course, you know that's not the right answer. You know that there's real reasons, real things to play on, of course, more than just on paper and how things are. Man, oh man, is it impressive what G2 does and how quickly they are able to lay down the gauntlet to the rest of the league that says, oh, you thought that was a nice little winter break for you? Welcome back to the spring split and welcome back to our region where we dominate. I'm ready to just stick G2 in the finals, let the other nine teams play for who's gonna be meeting up with them there. That's, that's how big the difference has been getting the last basically two years or at least year and a half that this roster has been together. I know it's two games. We still got the rest of week one to finish, but they look damn good uh, across those first two games. I'll tell you who looked surprisingly good. Another 2-0 start. Team Vitality. They combined now to put BDS in that 0-2 start, picking a win up against them, but absolutely carrying that momentum over from winter. I don't know what it was over the weekend, but Throw Photon alongside Dokla and Life. What were with these Rumble performances this weekend? Yes, sir. The Rumble coming on through, coming online, and doing that burn damage that we all love to see from our favorite Yordle of the top lane. I say favorite Yordle. No one's picking Tristana top as your favorite Yordle. Or, God forbid, Teemo. Come uh, on. You got Nar? Man. man, there's a lot of Yordles on the top lane, actually. I, I, 
My bad. I, I'm unfamiliar. I'll, I'll accept Nar into that one. He, yeah. He's a good boy. I'll, I'll take him in on that one. But man, yes, this Vitality team, what a good weekend start for them uh, in this uh, for the LEC in this spring split that we're moving through. I think a lot of the parts that you want to be seeing for Vitality popping off, doing the right thing. Mr. Uh, Viteo, of course, coming through and making it a big performance is one of the ones always love checking in with him on what's going on in the mid lane. Yeah, but I mean... The Rumble game for Photon, you got two guys getting caught, and it's straight up a 3v5, and my man flashes in a 1v4 and wins the team fight for them. So if he can level up to the first split or so that he was on Vitality, where we were hyped about him, then who knows how high this team can climb, but far and away the craziest stat for them this weekend in a single game. He'll say he was dead. He didn't die in a game as Nautilus. We've seen him go 0 and 10 on this pick multiple times. We've seen him go zero and ten on champions that are far less in the middle of the action. Never mind the one actually getting it started and popping it all off with the anchor. Yeah, he was fantastic this weekend. Another one to keep track of in the LEC. Man, that rumble pick though, and that confidence to, to me uh, for Photon to make that type of play. It's all about feeling out that damage, knowing where you are, and seeing a situation and going. They don't know what's about to hit him. I got what's coming up. But with their win, as I mentioned, BDS starts 0-2. Obviously, we had the Adam drama at the end of the regular season. If they have a real slow start, drop a couple more games, I can see uh, this thing really getting off the rails with Adam and behind the scenes, not getting wins on the Rift. I, I might start getting worried for BDS. Yeah, and this is where it needs to turn around a lot faster than I think a normal situation like this would call for. Normally, you know, you maybe lose a couple of these games, you can sit, sit it out type of thing. But knowing that there is turmoil, knowing that there was that up and down going through and enough that they felt like they needed to take disciplinary action against Adam. And then to see it weekly answered with, OK, well, we're right back to the same solution into the week one. And the game performances now aren't there for BDS. Yes, this is one of those ones where I think it is more of a panic situation to get a turnaround, get some results on the board for this BDS team. Because if it keeps spiraling, if it spirals fully through this weekend into the next week, and then you start out poorly there, I'm ready to write this one off for BDS, even with a lot of the improvements that I've seen from the other four members that make up this team. We'll give a breakdown of that finale in week one, do all the power rankings. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, beauties. Thanks for watching. Catch you on that flippity flip.